And today we uh, get back to Galatians chapter 4. We have been looking at this text for a few weeks and today we want to revisit uh, this chapter and look at some of the things that Paul develops um, in, in the middle of this section in chapter 4. We had seen that the Galatians were heirs of grace and that in Christ and that as a result of God's promise uh, it had nothing to do with them it certainly had nothing to do with their following the uh, legal prescriptions of the Old Testament uh, the Judaizers that had influenced the Colossian churches were trying to get the believers, predominantly these Gentile believers, to adopt a Jewish form of Christianity that included uh, circumcision and obedience to uh, sort of the, the Judaism that was current at the time in the first century. Not necessarily just the Old Testament, but particularly its interpretation of what the Old Testament scriptures had to the people of God in the Old Testament covenant era. So today uh, we look at chapter 4 beginning in verse 8 and this is continuing his development of this argument and now he, he begins to chide them a little bit. Uh, he's done this already in the letter um, and basically what I see here is I see his, his pastoral heart and He's urging them not, not to chide them so that they um, will feel bad, but I think he's urging them so that they would, they would respond in repentance, that they would recognize the error of their current ways and reflect on the gospel that was preached to them before. And he uses language here that, you know, it, it's strong language in a way, but I, I do believe that he... He has a good intention for the uh, Christians. And of course, we know that ultimately, you know, the true believer uh, is, is not going to suffer, uh, is not going to um, be subject to a loss of that justified state or anything of that nature. But Paul's argument is that if you are on this trajectory, then it leads you to ultimately trusting in something other than Christ. And so he would have to call into question the reality of the conversion of anyone who, who ignored his teaching and would continue to uh, try to follow these Jewish mystical practices and so forth. So if you have your Bible open, we're looking at Galatians 4, and I want to read from verse 8. And we'll stop reading at the, verse, at the end of verse 20 today. How be it then? When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? You have some days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness he spake on? For I bear you record that, if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes, and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always 
in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, or I stand in doubt of you. Let's uh, pray to you. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this book. Thank you for Paul and his labors. Most of all, thank you for Christ and his great love and his sacrifice on the cross. For he hath redeemed his people from their sins. Lord, we thank you for the ability to have a time today to set aside for worshiping you, hearing your word blessing your name, and being your people. God, be glorified in our midst. May your word reach fertile ground this morning. For the sake of Christ, amen. Amen. So here we have it. Paul is in the midst of this section where he's told them that they are no longer from the history of redemption back in the old time when they were young, they were children, they were under the tutelage of a guardian, etc., etc. Now, Christ, that faith has come. With the coming of Jesus Christ, all things are different, all things are changed. Uh, as he will say later on in chapter 6, you know, circumcision has no avail but a new creation. This is, this is the new blessing that Paul speaks of with the coming of Jesus Christ. So he, he begins here asserting that what they did and who they are now are two completely different things. He says, how be it then, when ye knew not God, did he serve unto them which by nature are no God? So you've got to remember, these are Gentiles. These are people that were converted from their pagan worship of deities that the world had, all of these so-called, you know, Greek and Roman gods, um, they, they are, according to Paul, not real. Um, he says in uh, 1 Corinthians that they are not real. They're, they're actually, they're demons, if you want. The, the people were worshipping uh, these gods as if they were real, but they are not. And so now he's recalling their history and he says, look, when you did not know the true God, you served these other deities, these fictitious characters that are no gods. Now, he says, but after, now, after that ye have known God, okay, contrast, very, very easy to follow what he's saying here. It's a before and an after. But he interrupts himself. And he does this purposefully. And, of course, there's a rationale why he does this. He says, okay, you didn't know God. Now you know God. But, rather, wait, let me, let me rephrase it, in other words. He's saying, now that you are known of God, you are now known by God. That's the, that's the truth that he wants to get to. You see, before, when they were doing service... So these deities they knew, knew not of, but they, they believed that they existed. It was all self-initiated. It was all stuff that they did. Here, however, he's saying, but now that you know God, well, wait a minute, let me, let me clarify. Why does he do this? Well, because you're knowing God in your old ways, or the gods, these plural deities that don't exist, was something that you did. It was something that you initiated. It was something that you, you know, worked at, and, and something that you put the you know, effort into doing, whereas now, now that you know God, well, the, the temptation is to think that this is the way you know the true God, the same way you knew those gods that weren't real, through effort, through some sort of mysticism, through some sort of, you know, effort on your part, work, or sacrifice, or ceremony, or whatever, and so this is particularly why, at this point, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, rather, are known of God. This becomes a passive notion. Okay, so what he's saying is, you do know God now, but everything that you have now with this new knowledge of the true living God 
is God initiated. It is God worked. It is God wrought. You did not come to this knowledge of God because you are smart, because you are faithful, because you are marked out somehow because of something in you that God sees and decides, okay, I'm going to bless them. No. There's no mysticism. There's no philosophy here. There's no religious ceremony or anything of that nature. This is something that happens to us because God has initiated it. Why does he say this? Well, because they have to get it clear in their minds what he has been harping on from the beginning. That their relationship with God is by grace through Christ. It is that work of God that has brought them to this new knowledge of the true living God. So, you know, it, it's, it's good to stop here for a moment and think about this. Do we know God? Well, of course, we, we, we as Christians, we, we know what Jesus said. He said that this is eternal life, that ye know God and whom he sent. The Lord Jesus, right? Jesus Christ. So, we do know God. On the other hand, the God that we know is incomprehensible. We don't know His nature. We don't know the essence of the God that we worship. We, we can't delve into the mysteries of divinity. But we do know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as He has revealed Himself. But revelation initiates with God. We don't discover God. We don't uncover Him. We don't do investigation and then therefore come up with God. We don't deduce God from the realities around us. We don't deduce God from the inner man. We do not deduce that God is real because of the world or any of these things. God has to open our hearts and reveal to us. And so rather than us knowing God, it is better to say that we are known of God. Now you're going to say, well, wait a minute, doesn't God know everyone? Of course He knows everyone. But that's not what it's getting at. When it says you are known of God, there's an intimacy involved. There's an intimacy that, say, for example, you find in Amos where it tells us, of all the families of the earth, Israel, you alone have I known. Wait a minute, didn't God know about the Cushites and the Ammonites and all these other people? Of course He knew of them. But he didn't know them in the way he knew Israel as his people, as his chosen, as his inheritance. And again, that was all God initiated. He takes a man who's a pagan worshiper and says, In you, I am going to glorify my name. In you, all the families of the world are going to be blessed. In you, I am choosing you. And so, later on, when the history of God's people is written by Moses, what does he say in Deuteronomy? Not because you were great in number, not because of this, were you chosen, but because God loved you. You are known of God, Israel. You are loved of God. So Jesus himself will say, in the end, when those people come to him and say, oh, in your name, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? And what will he say? He will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What do you mean you never knew me? <laughs> of course you know me. God, didn't, don't you remember all this stuff that I did for you? Well, of course he knows them, but he doesn't know them in this sense. He doesn't love them in this way. He is not related to them intimately, as Paul says here, known of God. To be known of God is to be loved of God. To be known of God is to be in intimate relation with God. Through Christ, by grace, and for His glory. So here the, the Galatians rather are, are drifting away from this message of the gospel. And you remember what Paul said, I am surprised that you are so quickly moving from Him. Moving from the gospel is moving in the wrong direction and it's moving away from God Himself. Is moving away from God Himself. So, what's the reminder here? The reminder is look, God has loved you, God has graced you through Christ. You know, this is why He says that beautiful thing we're graced 
in the Beloved in Ephesians. He uses this real, real, you know, pithy expression, but he uses the word, the frame is the word grace, but he says we've been graced. It's a, it's a real strange way of putting it, but we've been graced in the Beloved. These believers, they have come to be known of God, and they have awakened to that reality, and now they know that they are known of God. They recognize that God has done something through Christ in their lives. So why would you want to leave that and try to follow these other things that he calls beggarly elements that he says, you know, will bring you again into bondage. This is like Israel, you see. Israel comes out of their, you know, sojourn in, in Egypt, and, you know, first sign of difficulty, and what do they do? We want to go back to Egypt. At least we have something to eat there. Why would you want to go back to bondage? This is precisely the same thing. So, they have been duped by the teachers of, you know, this syncretistic Jewish, Greco-Roman mixed up religion that they're threatened by them that they will not be saved. As we've said before, that same message you find in Acts chapter 15, if you are not circumcised by the circumcision of Moses, you cannot be saved. Acts 15.1. So here it is. If you don't follow these customs, you can't be a true Christian. You can't be one of the Messiah's people. So they're duped. They're thinking, okay, Jewishness is all, you know, the, 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 the Messiah is. And, and this is a Jewish concept. We've come to be converted by the God of the Jews. We know Him now to be the God of everyone, but we want to be His people. And if that be, then we ought to listen to these ones. And Paul says, no. No. Why would you be willingly going back to beggarly elements that put you in bondage, and this is the, the irony here, that he says that basically he's using these Jewish categories and saying that they would be like, this is this something you've got to grasp, this is important. He says, in doing this, it will be like your prior life of worshipping the pagan deities. That's what he's likening their adoption of this Jewish mysticism as being like their old lives when they worship these deities that they didn't really, you know, know, but they did service unto them, you see. So this is this is the contrast, this before and after. And so he's now saying, look, you've become blessed in Christ. Why would you want to go back? Why would you want to do this? In fact, this isn't moving forward in the faith. This is actually going backwards like the way you were before you knew God. Or rather, unknown of God. It's, it's the great irony of the situation. Because, and I think Paul will bring this out, that their desire may be genuine on the part of the, the, the Galatians. They are seeking that which they believe will bring them closer to God. But you can't get any closer than Christ. You can't get any closer to God by adding something to Christ. Christ is the full measure of your relationship to God. He brings you into the fellowship of the triune God that is, the only God, the true living God, and He brings you as close as you can get to this God. You can't get any closer than that. You can't get any more than that. Having Christ is having everything. This is why He will say this to the Corinthians, you know. When He says that, you know, all things are yours, yours. God's, God, because you are Christ, and Christ is God's, you are His, you are His. You can't get any more than that. It's through Christ that we become heirs of God. You can't get any better than that. This is the same language that God used of Israel in the Old Covenant by saying, they are my 
treasured possession. They are my kingdom of priests. That is who we are in Christ. And you can't get any better. Why would you try? You're moving in the wrong direction. And so he goes on and he tells them, look, I'm afraid because now you observe days and months and times and years. And so which is different words for basically the Jewish calendar, if you will. These are, these are suggesting that they are trying to go back to some sort of ritual that, that you know, focuses on, on these festivals and the days and the, the participation of, of the people of God in these communal events and they're abandoning Christ for this. But they don't know. They think they're getting Christ and even more of Him by following this. But in essence, Paul is saying, no, if you do this, you're trying to be justified before God through the law. And you cannot be justified through the law. And he says, look, you know how through my own infirmity of the flesh when I came and I preached you that gospel which you first heard, which brought you to faith, which brought you to knowledge of Christ and His forgiveness, which brought you to the fact that now you as people who are Gentiles are part of this new work of God where the old has been broken down, the wall of separation is no longer, and now you have Jew and Gentile. Remember what he said in chapter 3, there is now no more Jew and Greek, there is no more male or female, in Christ, in salvation, in redemption. We're all one in Christ. But now, he says, you are tempted to forsake this. Don't you look at my example? He says, look, I am like you and you should be like me. The Jews, they wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Remember when he rehearsed this in chapter 2 with Peter, when you know, Peter came to Antioch and he was celebrating and eating with the, the, the Gentiles there. But then when those guys came from Jerusalem, he, 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 he got scared and he separated from them. And Paul had to confront him and say, look, you're not living according to the truth of the gospel. And he said this in front of everyone, remember, and he rebuked Peter. And so here he's saying, look, remember what happened when in those days and how you treated me. And you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Which some have suggested may be what Paul's thorn in the flesh wants. Something to do with his eyes. I don't know if that's true. But nonetheless, it may just be an expression. But what it betrays is their love for him. And their care for him when he first came and preached this message. That they were willing to do everything for him. And yet now he says. Now have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Now I have to write this letter. That's harsh. Now I have to write this letter and rebuke you. But I'm bringing the truth. Have I come to your enemy because I tell you the truth? You see, Paul had been maligned in their midst by these false teachers. He had been spoken ill of. The same we find in 2 Corinthians, where he defends his apostleship and explains that, you know, like he said in his book earlier in Galatians, you know, I received it from Christ. My apostleship doesn't come through any man. My authority is from God. He has called me. He who, who saw fit to separate me from my mother's womb. From that time, he said, from that time, meaning the time past, that when he saw fit to reveal himself to me, who was set apart even from before I was born, he says. Here it is. I'm bringing this warning upon you because the present condition makes me wonder whether I have labored in vain. Have I labored in vain? He's looking at the church and saying, if you keep going down this path, all you're proving is that I labored in vain. 
In other words, you're proving yourself to have maybe been excited for a while, maybe have come to, to the truth of Christ, but maybe, maybe not. But I think Paul will actually tell them at the end that he expects better things for them. And he hopes to continue to show them that they really are the inheritance of God, that they really are the people of God, that they really are God's children of promise. And he'll go and explain that going back into the law, even through this, what he calls an allegory here in the latter part of chapter 4 that we'll look at next time. We're not children of the flesh. We didn't come to this knowledge on our own by our effort. And we don't keep it through our effort. So these Judaizers, they weren't really saying, look, it's not Christ but the law. That wasn't the message. The message was Christ is great, but he's not enough. That's the message you're saying. And when you think about today and what passes for the church in our world, and the messages that you will hear, that's what comes through loud and clear many times. Christ is great, sure. But you've got to have baptism. Christ is great, yeah, but boy, you've got to you've got to pay a tithe. Christ is great, but you know what? You've got to become members of the congregation. And all these things, they're not necessarily bad in themselves, but what they are are detractions when you add them as a necessary ingredient of how one is right before God. No one is right before God by keeping the law. No one's right before God by getting baptized. No one is right before God by, by teaching a class or joining a group or whatever it may be, ceremony or mysticism or whatever is promised in addition to Christ. You don't get nearer to Christ by adding to Christ. <laughs> you get further away from it. That's the message of the gospel. That Christ not only is necessary, but Christ is sufficient. Christ is all you need. Wanting Him and something else may be that you don't really trust Him. Maybe you don't have your hope in Him, as the Reformer said, alone. Faith alone, in Christ alone. When it comes to our justification, which basically means, how does one stand right before God when one is sinful? How does God deal with that person? And what does He do? How does one get right standing before God? That's justification. That's what this letter is about. And it's telling us in this book that it is through Christ, by grace, and it's received in faith alone, not in faith and. It's Christ alone, by faith alone. And ultimately, we know this through the Scripture, and it's for the glory of God. We know these things. But sometimes we're tempted, just like these Galatians were, to think, oh, you know what? This church has this program. Let's go there and see what this is about. Let's get involved in this ministry. Let's do this. And then God's really going to now God blesses obedience, don't get me wrong. But you will no more be justified into eternity than you are right now by trusting in Christ. Absolutely. You will be no more right with God than you are right now by trusting Christ alone. Right now. And the corollary to that is... If you say, okay, I don't believe in Christ, Christ is fine. This is what the Muslims say. Christ is good, but we'll add a little bit more to that. Let's add Muhammad to that. Let's add the Quran to that. Hindus will say, oh yeah, Jesus is fine. He's one more of the three million gods that we worship, or 300 million gods 
that we worship. Add him on. Jesus and. Jesus plus. Many people will say, Jesus is fine. Jesus is great. Jesus was a good man. In fact, if you learn anything about the history of, uh, of this nation, you'll see that many of the founding fathers of this country said, Jesus is great. But Jesus wasn't enough. Jesus wasn't enough. What Paul is saying here is because you have been known by God, that suffices. Because this began with God, and it will end in glory for God, because salvation is by His means. You can't just willy-nilly decide today, oh, I'm going to know God. You know what? I'm, I'm just going to make it my aim today. I'm going I'm to figure Him out. I'm going to decide that I want religion. I'm going to find God. That's not how it works. God opens your eyes through Christ by faith alone. And that's how, because you are now known of God, you don't need anything else. Christ alone suffices. For those who are known of God, they know that Christ alone suffices. Don't be duped by the false teachers that will come and tell you, in addition to Christ, you need something there's nothing more. So, have I run in vain? Have I labored in vain? What am I doing? Paul says. I am continuing this trek because I want Christ to be fully formed in you. I want you to know Him all the more. Not to know Him and something more, but to know Him all the more. What did he say to the Philippians? That I might know him and the power of his resurrected life. That I might know him. That I might know him. Do you know Christ? Do you know Christ? Or do you just know about him? Do you know Christ? Do you love him? Do you spend time with him? Do you hear his voice? Do you walk with him? How can you walk unless you agree? How can you have fellowship if you're walking in darkness? How can you know Christ if you're seeking after the beggarly elements of the world? Only those who are known of God are blessed with this secure knowledge of their own salvation. And God is pleased to announce them as heirs of God by the promise through faith in His Son. Dear Lord, we again bow before you, for you are the true living God. You are majestic, imperial, you are the King of kings. You are our creator and sustainable that is. Without you there would be nothing, and because of you there is everything. Lord, you have created this world, you have set up its trajectory, your plan is being fulfilled world is being conquered by your gospel. Father, draw us in. Open our eyes. Reveal Christ in all his glory to us. Let us see him as the altogether lovely, as the lily of the valley, as the fairest of 10,000. God, open our eyes that we may see his glory even in the cross. That we recognize what he's done for us is something we could never do for ourselves. God, draw our hearts close to you. Give us this desire within for truth. Make our lives count. Be pleased with us. Be pleased to reveal yourself all the more in us. As Paul said, that we might be those in whom Christ is fully formed. Those are our longings, God. Those are our desires. Honor them as much as they are tainted with sin. Purify them. And bless 
your people with peace. Again, for we ask it in the name and for the sake.